morning, Mimi. <laughs> uh, Andy Sinatra in the back. Uh, Latib Saidu, great. Uh, Sarah Sweeney, there you are in the back. And Ayana Marcus, also part of our program team, is here. Jan Dorman, where are you, Jan? There she is. <laughs> um, and then Ebony Bug is up in the front, and she'll be helping us moderate our conversation today. And of course, everybody knows Brennan Gould, our president and CEO. Um, I also want to uh, thank some of our board members for coming. Jay Kessler is here with us this morning, as is Rick Richmond. Where are you, Rick? There he is. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank, or uh, uh, where's Gwen? There's Gwen. Gwen is a longtime volunteer at the Community <coughs> Foundation and a wonderful thought partner and uh, for all of us. So Gwen, it's always lovely to have you here as well. Um, I also want to thank our panelists for being here this morning. Um, Ebony is going to do formal introductions for each of you later, but I just want to say thank you and we so appreciate your time and um, all of the wisdom we know you're going to impart on us this morning. So thank you for being here. Um, so we're really excited that we're kicking off our 2019 donor engagement series uh, this morning. May may be a little late for a kickoff date, but it's our kickoff date. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are really building on a program that we started last year. We had three events last year with our donors, and we are excited to have, again, we'll host three more this year. And really the, the purpose of these events is really, uh, sort of the theme of these events is around connection. And I look at, for our donors, it's connection to each other, it's connection to the foundation team, and it's connect, connection to our community. And we are so thankful that all of, that we have that op this opportunity and we get to share this time with all of you. Um, I also just want to point out that these, are, these events are never about an ask, other than we ask you to engage with us as learners and community members and um, are excited for your partnership in, that, in those efforts. Um, so, in talking about our program today, um, you may wonder why are we talking about housing. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but I feel like right now, really not a day goes by where I don't hear something either at the national or local level about housing, whether it's housing affordability or housing crisis. I lived in the Bay Area for a long time and that's been an issue there for 40 years. So, um, I wasn't there 40 years ago. But. A long time. <laughs> I was like, hold on. <laughs> um, so it is. I think it is a. There is no question that this is a topic that's kind of dominating our our, so our conversation right now. And in Charlottesville, um, or really all over the place, right? This is a really big topic, and it's a topic when you talk about housing. Um, it's hard to find common definitions for what affordable housing means to people. And when Brennan and I first started thinking about this program, uh, sort of one of the quandaries was, do we do a, you know, kind of affordable housing 101? And of course, no one has a semester to spend with us. So that's, out of, uh, that's off the table. And so what we decided to do is think really, um, think really deeply and kind of small around this the sort of issue of, or the sort of the work that's happening in our community with neighborhood redevelopment. And that is why we have the four folks here that we do. Um, these are the, the people closest to the work and the people that are gonna be able to share their insights and experiences with us that hopefully will make us even more informed community members. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. Um, and one of the really important lessons I've learned at the foundation is, well, you know, we are positioned in a, a way in the community that we're always, we're looking and seeking to understand what's happening in our community today. But in order to do, sort of answer the question of where are we now, we have to take time to look at where have we been and what got us here. And so when I think about that historical context, especially around the issues of housing, we have some very um, discreet, uh, uh, policies that basically that have been enacted that for in the in the 20th century that really were designed to be um, to exclude po whole populations of people oftentimes most oftentimes based on race and while there were many policies that we can go back and, and look at I think one in particular that's incredibly important and relevant for today's conversation are the policies that were passed around home ownership and loans 
And historians tell us, and we, we know that um, there were very, again, policies that made it incredibly difficult for folks living in certain neighborhoods to get a home loan. And what the implications were that, not only were for that family in the 1940s, they weren't able to own a home, but there were implications for generations to come. And generations both in terms of home ownership, but also in terms of wealth accumulation. Because the number one vehicle to accumulate wealth in our, in our society is home ownership. So if your family in the 1940s can't own a home, can't get a home loan and can't own a home, that implication means, the, the implications of that are that you don't have that wealth to pass down for generations to come. So as we think about this issue of, of housing today and specifically around neighborhood redevelopment, it's really important to, as we think about today's context, to continue to go back to what got us here in order to help make sure that we are designing solutions and designing remedies that are complex enough to deal with really um, a, a, quite a historical legacy. So I just want to sort of frame that in terms of the conversation today. Um, we are so excited about all of the conversations that are happening in our community right now. And we hear conversations around housing. We hear conversations around jobs and wages, around um, economic mobility. And it is so wonderful to be part of. I'm relatively new to Charlottesville. I've only been here a couple of years. And it's so um, energizing for me to be part of a community that is really committed and where you have so many different groups of people really thinking about the health and the wellness of our community as a whole. So um, I just want to say thank you again all for being here. Um, and I'm really excited to hand it over to the panelists who are going to at least, I know, make me a lot smarter than I am right now. So <laughs> I will give it over to Ebony and our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ebony Bug, our Director of Programs at the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation. It's really lovely to see you all here today. I'm really grateful for uh, your presence. And I also just wanted to acknowledge Larry Martin and Antoine Brinson, who are uh, members of our uh, Investment and Grants Portfolio Committee. Um, we just have a huge um, support system at the Foundation that allows us to do our work. And I'm grateful for your presence here uh, today. Um, before, uh, let's see, I'm going to start by introducing um, our panelists. Um, uh, first to my left, we have Dan Rosenzweig from the uh, Habitat for Charlottesville, overall Habitat for Humanity, um, and he's the executive director there. Uh, we have Ann Kingston with Red Light Management, Sunshine Mathan from Piedmont Housing Alliance, the executive director, and Yolanda Harrell, the executive director of Neil Hill Development Corporation. Um, so first a, a round for our um, esteemed panelists who will be uh, sharing their work with us today. Um, so the first question um, that I'm uh, going to ask is really building off of what Katie just shared with us and wanting to hear from our panelists um, about their programming. Um, and I just want to add to um, a little bit about what Katie was talking about with regards to these policies like redlining, um, movements like urban renewal, racial covenants, and things like that that all contributed to sort of um, the, 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 the environment that we find ourselves in today. Um, but one of the things that is sometimes missing from that conversation is also the destruction of neighborhood and community that comes along with these processes. And it's one of the reasons that we're focusing on neighborhood redevelopment is not simply about the land and it's not simply about asset building, but also about world building, community building. Um, and we recognize that each of those things are part of what makes um, a life bright, vibrant for people. It's not simply the edifice um, that we live on, the streets that allow us to get to and from, but the relationships between us. And so carrying through with that understanding and that notion of connection, uh, we want to keep those things in mind and really keep ourselves um, both focused on the projects that are here, but also understanding the people that are um, not just on the panel, but are standing behind and, um, and are part of this process of, of renewal. Um, so uh, the first question I have for um, the panelists is to simply, each of you can take a moment uh, to describe your project and how it relates to this historical context of affordable housing, race, power. Um, as well as our current circumstances. Sure. Okay. I think 
figure this out as we go along. So, uh, thank you, Ebony, very much for having me here. Thank you all for, for showing up today and for all the work that you do in the community to support um, uh, organizations like Habitat and the folks here up on the dais uh, to help make this world a little bit better. Um, I'm really, really glad that Katie gave the introduction that she did because it was it actually sort of dovetails with what I wanted to talk about, and that is the reason why we're in a position of doing the work that we do, um, and it's not an accident. It's not a historical accident. A lot of it was very intentional. A lot about a lot of what I'm about to say is probably a little bit more germane to the folks up here because they're living in neighborhoods or they're working in neighborhoods in Charlottesville that were purposefully removed. Um, uh, in the name of urban revitalization. So what you have in front of you, if, if people wouldn't mind picking up uh, this green and blue colored map. Th there are two maps side by side, and I think looking at these two maps side by side is really uh, important. On the, uh, the colorful map is our zoning map. That tells you what you can do on a parcel of land in Charlottesville. And what do you notice? What's the, what's the most predominant color on the map? Yellow, yeah. So more than 70% of the land mass of the city of Charlottesville is is R1 zoning, uh, residential one. It means that you can do one thing and one thing only on the land, and that's to have a single family home. That's not in itself controversial, it shouldn't be. Uh, and then like a lot of cities in the country, uh, you see a much more, the darker the color gets, the more intense the use, the more dense the uh, residential development can be. And that's not, this is a pattern development that is like most cities in America. Um, but it becomes interesting when you start to peel the onion skin back a little bit. And if you look at the other map, which looks oddly similar to it, this is a map drawn by a fellow named Harlan Bartholomew, who was an urban planner uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, who was invited to come to the city of Charlottesville and say, you know, what are the good neighborhoods? What are the neighborhoods that are worth preserving? What are the neighborhoods that we have to kind of, you know, get rid of? And what he did, is, if you look on the other map, is he drew, circle, he drew circles around the neighborhoods that, um, that, that really um, were a little ramshackle and they needed to go. Well, these were mostly African-American neighborhoods. They were a little bit ramshackle, largely because many of them in the city wouldn't extend water and sewer to them. So they were actually pockets of unincorporated um, um, uh, parts of the city of Charlottesville. They were almost all uh, African-American owned. So they were residences that were African-American owned. They were businesses that were African-American owned. And even the people who rented typically rented from African-American landlords. Well, Harlan Bartholomew said, look, these neighborhoods are kind of run down. We need, to, we need to tear them down. And that's exactly what we did without a plan for redevelopment. And in its place, uh, we built public housing. Um, we built uh, a privately subsidized or publicly subsidized private affordable housing and barrack style housing, the kind of stuff that um, Sunshine and Anne in particular are interested in, um, um, uh, in working with. Um, so if you dig, if peel another layer of the onion skin back, and you'll notice if you go to the courthouse and you start pulling deeds, most of the most of the properties that are R1 in the city of Charlottesville uh, were, were restricted to whites only. And why was that? Well, because the Federal Housing um, Authority, FHA, only backed loans in the time of great suburban expansion to builders like Levitt, for example, who were building large tract developments. Uh, and the requirement for, for these large construction loans was that you could only sell to whites. And, um, and that's what happened in Charlottesville, is that the vast majority of Charlottesville was excluded purposefully to people of color. Uh, and then what did we do? We took all the rest of it and we tore it down. The legacy of this has been terrible. And if you turn to the next page, and this is something that this is why I'm really a supporter of Yolanda's work, because the legacy of this has been is that we've, we've essentially lost an African-American middle class. Uh, African Americans in the city of Charlottesville, on average, have one tenth the wealth of of of, of people who uh, of of other folks, non African Americans in the city of Charlottesville, largely because they don't own homes and they don't own businesses. And Yolanda's purpose, in some ways, I don't want to speak for you, but is to is to great. is to <laughs> is to do the groundwork necessary to restore. It's a it's a long game, but to restore uh, an African American. American middle class. So if you look at the next 
uh, map. It's a map that looks oddly similar to the zoning map and the Bar Bartholomew map, and that's Rich Schuyler's uh, Orange Dot project, where he basically talked about opportunity by zip code. And if you look at the, the darker colors are the more impoverished, impoverished neighborhoods, the neighborhoods without the kinds of opportunities, uh, um, uh, economic opportunities available in other, um, in other neighborhoods in the community. And the darker the color, the less opportunity, the lower the income. And you'll notice that the darkest color right in the middle are the same places that Harlan Bartholomew drew a circle around and said, we have to, we have to tear these down. And so I'm really, really grateful to be working side by side with these folks. We all are in this together. We all see ourselves as partners. And um, and I'll talk. I think we'll have a little bit more time to talk about what we're specifically doing. Is it? Uh, if you just wanted to share a little bit about sort of name your project and um, and how how it relates to the things that you're just describing. Okay. Because because mostly I want to praise these guys because <laughs> we're I think we're we're coming to the conclusion here. So, so 2017, the reaction to 2017 was not an accident, and there's no accident. It's not, it wasn't an accident that housing became the has become the issue that has catalyzed. Um, uh, movement towards towards change, and it's the how it's the it's the um, uh, it's the issue that creates the most heat and light, not because you have people yelling and screaming loudest about it, but because of naturally because of occurring intentional circumstances that caused it. So if you look on the next page, this is Habitat's pr this is basically our plan to try to address this. And so most of you know Habitat as a builder. Uh, we we work with low income folks to prove their credit, uh, uh, to learn how to build a home. We work side by side with them as they build a house uh, and then purchase the house at, uh, with a zero interest loan indexed to what they can afford and they build equity. So we're really pleased that over the years we've sold more than 220 homes to families between 25 and 60% of area median income, so folks who make as little as fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a year. Uh, and they've earned collectively more than $60 million in home equity. The vast majority of folks that we've worked with have been African Americans from the city of Charlottesville. But we realized that's not enough. And so a bunch of years ago, about 15 years ago, we got into neighborhood redevelopment when the Sunrise Trailer Court was uh, put up for sale and was purchased by a developer who was going to do what developers do, make highest and best use of the land and build luxury condos and kick the people out. And we felt like it was a moral and ethical imperative to stand up and do something. We had no idea how to do this, but we knew that we had to do it. It was a moral imperative to do so. And so we worked with the residents of Sunrise to create a plan of development, and it's the first trailer park transformation in the nation without resident displacement. Now it's a home it's to 70 families, a mixed income development. There's a, a, a affordable housing for the people who've lived there for much of their lives. There's new opportunities for Habitat partner family homeowners, and there's market rate purchasers as well. So we were pretty pleased that you know we've been able to serve the community. We had built our capacity to build about 20 homes a year from where we were a few years ago, which was about three or four homes a year. But we realized that when you look at the totality of the challenge in Charlottesville, not just the quantitative, but also the qualitative, as mapped out by geographical segregation, we need to do more. So we have a three, essentially three lines of business. The first one is building, and in, in that we build homes and we build mixed income communities and we build in mixed income communities. So we've now built nine mixed income communities in the city of Charlottesville and the county of Albemarle. Rebuilding central to that is the Southwood Mobile Home Park. It's uh, just south of town. It's 123 acres, 1,500 people, the lowest of low income folks in the community who are the greatest concentration of low income folks. It doesn't mean the, uh, uh, in the community who are housed. Um, and so we've been working side by side with them since 2007 to develop a plan of development. And I'm pleased to tell you that we're about a, a month away from rezoning and we're planning to break ground in about a year or so. Uh, but also in rebuilding, we realize that there are also people, there are also partner agencies that are that have done incredible work in the space. So the Albemarle Housing Improvement Program, for example, is an incredible partner organization that goes, they, I mean, they score well above their what you'd think their capacity would be in terms of the number of folks that they help. They help folks stay in their homes. They've been great through the years at doing emergency rehabs and helping folks who own their homes stay in their homes. Um, but So we wanted to look at rebuilding in a slightly different way. And so we wanted to try to intervene in neighborhoods before they started to decline. So one of the things that we're doing now that's different than what we used to do is we're looking at the, we're looking at the numbers in neighborhoods. And we're starting to see some neighborhoods, particularly suburban ring neighborhoods, that used to be 95% home ownership. And now those ownership rates have declined into the 30s. 
from the surface, the neighborhoods look fine. But, there's, it, but most of the investors are outside investors who don't live here. And what you can do is fast forward in your mind 30 years. These are going to be the neighborhoods that it's going to take remarkable, incredible intervention to turn them around. And then there's going to be the tension that they'll start to gentrify after you turn them around. So what we're doing in those neighborhoods is we're going in and we're targeting, uh, we're purchasing homes in those neighborhoods. We're rehabbing them and we're selling them to Habitat partner families to reinvest those neighborhoods with affordable housing before they start to fail. And then uh, house three, housing system development, is a whole new line of business for us. And that's basically how are we going to work together with all the other people in the housing space to create a holistic housing ladder of opportunity for everybody. Because if all we did was Habitat, we wouldn't do nearly enough. If all we did was public housing, we wouldn't do nearly enough because there wouldn't be any place for people to go. If all we did was Friendship Court, if all we did was any of the one things that we did, that all of us are doing, that's not enough. For a housing system to work, and it's a system, it's an ecosystem, it's a living thing, it ha there has to be dynamism in the system, there has to be pe places for people to go. So for example, we're working with, of the 53 families working their way through our program right now, 37 of them actually are in public housing right now. So by doing our work, we're helping create dynamism in the public housing system. So this is about creating new products, imagining what we could do. So we're piloting an, an accessory dwelling unit program where people, low-income folks, actually own not only their own homes, but they rent affordably an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, partnerships, we're part of a housing coalition called the Charlottesville Albemarle Affordable Housing Coalition with uh, four other providers, and we're working together to, to really create this holistic housing ladder. So this is our... You want me to move on? Well, I'm gonna, uh, I thought it was a good segue to think about the, the ladder so that we can hear a little bit about public okay. housing uh, redevelopment, and we can uh, circle back around to think about what the, the sort of near-term large-scale investment opportunities are. First, I just want to explain why I'm here. I feel like I'm a little bit of an anomaly on this group. Um, so I work at Red Light Management, as Ebony said, which uh, you might not think has anything to do with housing. Uh, we manage bands, so we manage, um, <laughs> so I'm in the music business, uh, but we manage <clears throat> like 250 bands, one of uh, whom is a Dave Matthews band, who, as many of you know, is from Charlottesville and has had a long history of grant making in Charlottesville. And my boss, Goran Capshaw, has uh, lived in Charlottesville for 40 years and done a lot in the community. And over the years, um, just as a grant maker, we learned about the state of public housing and got to know many of the residents. Um, actually, I think, Holly, you were our foray into public housing, really. Um, it was uh, one of the residents that approached you about the after-school program needed some funding. So we had helped fund the after-school program. And then it was the clinic. And then it was West Haven Community Day. And so we had this relationship with the residents through um, some grant making we had done. And we really noticed like the absolute uh, dire state that housing was in. So um, more recently, residents approached us and, and said, hey, it seems like you know you guys have been developers in the community. You've done a lot of grant making. Could we partner and work together on trying to redevelop public housing? So that's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> so we've been working with Brandon with FAR, which is the Public Housing Association of Residents. And I guess we started this conversation uh, deeply about it uh, almost two years ago following the August events, which, you know, obviously the August events were horrific in every way, but I think the one silver lining of what happened was that it raised a lot of people's awareness for the inequity that already existed here. And I think housing is, you know, one of the biggest examples of that inequity. And what all of us are working on is to help fix that problem. So specifically what we are working on is public housing. Um, and we're clipping along at a fast pace to try and turn that around. Um, we're currently going to start construction end of this year or early next year on renovating Crescent Halls, which is a senior facility on Monticello. And then we're building brand new housing on South First Street. Um, so that's our initial plan. And then our group, in addition to helping FAR and the Housing Authority do the work, is also raising the gap funding to make it happen. So is there anything more specific I can say? On no, I, I appreciate that. 
Um, so our group, as, as philanthropists in town, we're really supportive of what Habitat's doing and do see the connection with how do you go from public housing to home ownership opportunities like you're talking about. And then also supportive of what Sunshine's doing, specifically with Friendship Court and what Yolanda's um, vision for the future is of how do we recreate an African-American middle class that's been lost in what happened in the 60s and, and following that. Good morning. Um, sorry, is that too close? Uh, my name is Sunshine Mathon. I'm the executive director of Piedmont Housing Alliance. Um, uh, again, excellent intro, Dan. And, and Dan covered a number of topics, uh, but the one I want to focus on is um, the need for a broad spectrum, a, a holistic housing ladder. And so, as Dan said, the home ownership, and as the intro as well, home ownership is a key ingredient to uh, building wealth for families throughout the community, throughout the nation. But it's not the only form of housing we need. Um, we need rental housing as well, which is a large part of what we're talking about with Friendship Court specifically. But more broadly, Piedmont Housing Alliance, we play a role. Uh, we're a 35-year-old nonprofit, if you're not familiar. Um, we work a lot in the city of Charlottesville, but we actually support um, home ownership models around the, the, the five surrounding counties as well. So we provide, we're the, the primary um, HUD certified uh, housing and financial counseling agency in the region. Um, and we deploy down payment assistance and uh, first time home buyer assistance for families who are trying to buy a home, low income families who are trying to buy a home. And oftentimes that means we can help leverage as much as 20 or 25% of a, um, a down payment towards the cost of the house. So if, a co if the house costs $200,000, we can bring $40,000 to the table. Uh, or even sometimes more. Um, and it basically sits there as a second lien on the house um, and only, and oftentimes gets forgiven over time, but depending on the funding source may uh, just only be needed to be repaid if they sell the house in the future. So if they invest in the home, they own it for the long term and they pass it down to their children, that will never come to bear. Um, so it can be, you can pass it on generationally. In addition to um, the support and uh, the financial and housing counseling in the region, um, we, we do own and operate 600 units of affordable housing uh, throughout the community, <clears throat> and all that's rental housing. Um, um, a lot of that, probably about half of it at this point, focuses on seniors and folks with disabilities. Um, so folks uh, who are vulnerable populations who are often on fixed incomes. Um, so for those, family, for those individuals and families, <clears throat> the prospect of buying a home probably isn't that realistic. In some cases it is, some cases we can work that through. But um, you know, when you're making $800 or $1,000 a month through Social Security, and that's your only income looking forward, really what you need is a place that you can feel pride in calling home and that is stable for you over the long run. And that's a lot of what we provide. Um, we also serve families. And in particular with Friendship Court, and I think that's the nature of the conversation to some extent today, um, the Friendship Court, um, the, the location of Friendship Court was, uh, was impacted by urban renewal and urban, urban quote-unquote revitalization uh, back in the 60s in the same way that Vinegar Hill was here in the community. So prior to Friendship Court existing, <clears throat> it was a community with businesses and homes um, operated in, and lived in primarily by African-American families. Every time I talk about Friendship Court, we have, to, we have to talk about that history. You can't move forward, you can't think of a vision to the future without acknowledging that past. Um, Nonetheless, over the last 40 to 41 years since Friendship Court was built, <clears throat> there are, it, is a, it has become a community. So even though it has a history of, of um, dark roots, at the same time, it is a, for many families, it's a home, it's a place to call community, it's a place they love. Um, for some families, um, you know, we, we have seniors there who will probably be there over the long term, again, in those fixed income situations. We have families who, who come to Friendship Court seeking to, uh, in a time of crisis, to, because they're in their family, and a family's in crisis, their finances are in a crisis, they need a place they can afford and live and be able to get to, to jobs and get to educational opportunities. Um, and then they can figure out how to stabilize them, them, their families and, and move on with, with support structures. And, but there are a lot of folks who uh, get stuck. Um, they have aspirations of potentially moving on, aspirations potentially of home ownership, um, or maybe not in home ownership, but just starting a business or you know, kind of moving up and on. 
but the cycles of generational poverty in our community are intense vortexes that hold people in their place. Um, the, the measure, one measure of that is that uh, Charlottesville is in the bottom 3% nationwide for opportunities for upward economic mobility. Um, I've heard, I've had um, uh, friends and residents at Friendship Court who have said, you know, if you're born poor in Charlottesville, you die poor in Charlottesville. Um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty rough assessment of your future. Um, so as we think about the redevelopment of Friendship Court, yes, we're talking about housing. Yes, we're talking about um, revitalizing a neighborhood to bring back uh, a sense of, of um, beauty, a sense of pride, a sense of opportunity. Um, but if all we do at the end of the day is build uh, better housing and we don't do anything else, we're just going to help people be poor better. So we have to think differently collectively about how we're building the, the holistic uh, um, housing system, but also opportunities for upward economic mobility that include job training, that include educational opportunities, <clears throat> that include high quality uh, early childhood opportunities for, for um, the families and the, and the children in those families. All of that is how we're, <clears throat> excuse me, all of that is how we're thinking about the redevelopment of Friendship Court. It's not just about the housing, it goes far beyond. And I'll just pause there. Hi, I'm Yolanda Harrell, and I'm with New Hill Development Corporation, and uh, I am excited to be on the panel and, and be partnering with uh, these folks up here on the, on the dais, and, and Dan, you always do such a phenomenal job with, you know, bringing uh, pieces that help really tie the, uh, the information together and really uh, kind of put it out there for individuals to be able to consume in a way that makes sense. Um, and so. Uh, a large part of what we've been talking about is housing and, and what does that mean. And one of the things that we also talk about is community and how that community for, specifically for the African Americans in Charlottesville was lost in some ways and it was reconnected in other ways. Um, but one of the things that we look at from the history of um, urban, you know, urban renewal or revitalization, however you want to call it, uh, I, I think it was more just renewal in one sense because the revitalization didn't happen. Uh, when you look at Vinegar Hill, that set vacant for 20 years, so it really wasn't a revitalization plan. Uh, but when you look at the number of businesses that were lost, the number of home ownership that was lost, there was a lot of people that were buying a home. They were in the middle of a mortgage, and then that suddenly went away. And that has to be not only financially devastating, but spiritually and emotionally devastating as well. And then what is that, what, get, what happens in that home as that um, plays out? Um, not only do the children see what happened, but then they have to deal with the reality of the community, if you will, that they live in, this is what the community did to them. And so how do we, how do we revive ourselves from that? I think in a lot of ways, some folks have moved forward, but there have been many more that have not. And so for New Hill, our goal is to create more opportunities for African Americans, more economic mobility opportunities. Uh, we believe that every aspect of housing is needed, um, but we also believe that there needs to be more wealth building opportunities through business ownership, through job, uh, to, to better jobs. Um, not, you know, a lot of our millennials, a lot of them aren't thinking about home ownership right away. So, What's, you know, what does housing look like for them? It looks a little bit differently. Uh, and so we wanna think about all of those pieces, but we do think a lot about ownership and how do we have uh, a space that African Americans in our community can feel like is theirs. Uh, we've been uh, uh, partnering with the city to do a small area plan, which we are focusing on the Star Hill area because it does incorporate part of what was uh, Vinegar Hill. And we take our name, we pay homage to Vinegar Hill because we, we think about the history and the legacy and the, our ancestors that, kept, that went before us and all the work that they put in, and then that work got, it really kind of came to a halt, it was stunted in a lot of ways. So how do we help to bring that work and that effort that they put in back into our community so that African Americans can truly see themselves represented here in Charlottesville as part of the vibrant um, fabric of the, the social community as well as the business community here in Charlottesville. And so there has to be room for that. And right now, there's not really room for that. When you, we look at vacancy rates for um, storefronts, and for individuals that wanna have a storefront business, vacancy rate is very limited. And that's very good in one aspect. That means 
you know, hey, for those that own those buildings, then they, they hardly ever have a vacancy. But it's not very good for those who are wanting to start a business because they can't find an affordable place to be able to start that business. Uh, a lot of uh, members of our community, as uh, the others mentioned, they, they want to own a business. But how are they going to get started? How are they going to have the resources that they need if the storefronts are five and six thousand dollars a month in rents in order to be able to have a business? Um, so that's one aspect that we're looking at is how do we create those opportunities? Where Where is that place? And uh, as we've been doing our focus groups this week for our um, small area plan, one of the things that we, when we were talking with uh, some of the the black entrepreneurs was, um, you know, not even just the black entrepreneurs, but just other members of the community that some who had moved here, some who had moved back here that said, we don't see a place for us. We don't see where we can go and we can be free to be who we are and that's culturally relevant to us in a, in a large way. There's small things, there's events that happen, but there's no places for us. And so I think that you know, once upon a time, that was that existed a lot in Charlottesville, where there was community and there was places, and those communities do exist in Friendship Court and in West Haven. Those individuals have formed their own community, but how do we broaden community in Charlottesville so that other individuals that can all, you know, have a place that they can go that they feel like is for them and is by them and has their goals and their um, their dreams and their aspirations in mind. And so that's what we seek to, to try and do is create some of that space and bring some of that back. But we do want to be very intentional that we want to make sure that it is it is giving folks an avenue. So for individuals who want to go in a different direction, if they want to own a business, that there's a, a way to be able to do that. Not, we're not, our goal is not to force anyone or to say what anyone should do, but our goal is to say, if you want to do this, Here's how we're going to help build an avenue, a way, a path, as many of us are trying to do here, so that you can be able to, to do that. So there has to be a spectrum of housing. Um, there has to be a, a place where you can maybe get, get your start, uh, where you maybe can you know, uh, get yourself back on your feet. And then as you want to stabilize yourself, you know, what is that? And then as you start to dream and as you think about your future, your children and your children's children, what does that look like? And, and do you have the means to be able to be able to pass wealth forward? For us, it is very important that the African-American community has the ability to pass wealth forward so that we can we can share in the vitality of this community and that we can help to um, even make it a more vibrant uh, community. We see a lot of talent leaving our community, uh, a lot of children that grow up here that um, when, you know, when they talk about going to college, what they don't talk about is coming back to Charlottesville because they don't see that Charlottesville is a place for them as an African American. They don't feel like that they're going to get the opportunity that they want for themselves here. And that's, that's something that has to change. Uh, we also see that other members that move here they feel like they're doing time in Charlottesville. Well, my job requires me to be here for two years. That's what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to hightail it out here to the next place that I that I feel more comfortable. Uh, and I think that that is a missed opportunity for us as well. I think there's a lot of the great things about our community, and then there's a lot of opportunity within our community. And so our goal is to be able to to work in partnership to say how can we make this a better place, not just for small segments or one segment of our population but how can we make it a better place for all of us? And how do we make sure that as individuals are seeking to better themselves, that that is not something that is hopeless and it's not something that they feel like is an insurmountable uh, uh, you know, dream to have, that they can truly dream, that they can see people that look like them doing the things that they desire to do someday. That ought to be represented and it shouldn't be a one or two, we shouldn't just, if we can name how many black owned restaurants are in Charlottesville, that's a problem. If you can name how many black doctors there are in Charlottesville, that's a problem. And the unfortunate reality is, is that most of us, especially those that care about that, we can name them. And so 
that's a problem. We got to get to a place where there is an abundance, and so and that they are out there and they're they're visible and people can see them, and that African Americans that come to this community can stop saying where are all the black people. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, reflect back on some of the things, the common threads that we've um, picked up on here today. And I was speaking to Anne earlier, and I think one of the things that she mentioned is that the, the level of partnership at, at these various segments is, is quite unprecedented, um, both in the history of Charlottesville and is innovative with regards to initiatives that are um, happening um, across the country. And so wanting to reflect that um, oftentimes we um, operate with a scarcity kind of um, a mindset with regards to resources. Um, and yet we are operating with the fundamental belief that we have the material and human capital in our community in order to solve our problems. And I think that you're seeing this here on display with the understanding that there are sufficient resources to go around and that we each have our role to play in creating this dynamic housing environment um, or ladder uh, to, to borrow Dan's uh, terminology there. The other piece that I hope that you're picking up on and hearing is really this investment in people as a, in addition to the edifices and the land um, that folks are talking about developing, but that these are about communities. Uh, these are, this is about safety, it's about belonging. And we don't often think about those things when we're already experiencing them. And yet, if anyone here has engaged in a house buying um, process, <laughs> at some point in time, you recognize that there is such emotional content that's involved in that. You're thinking about that master floor bedroom because you're envisioning yourself in your old age or your kids, or is that hill too high for your grandchildren? And do we need a retaining wall, et cetera? And so these questions that we often relegate to uh, conversations related to economic mobility and, um, and, and the numbers is really about our, our feelings, our feelings of safety, our feelings of belonging. Can I see myself here in this place? Um, and so I think that that's a really critical and relevant piece, particularly as it relates to redevelopment in that oftentimes um, large scale redevelopment in our community has resulted in a loss of culture in addition to uh, community and, and in addition to opportunities for economic mobility and asset um, building. And so um, I, I'm going to move on. Uh, we're here today really to understand, um, to really understand um, how we can um, be, be good stewards of this work and be good partners with you all in this work. Um, and so there are various levels in which we can engage with you and we want to try to figure out ways that everybody, given their uh, resources, their passions, their interest and level of commitment can engage in this good work with you. Um, and so we're looking for um, these key levers of change. And I'm curious, first of all, to think about what are some of the larger scale kind of systems level um, opportunities for investment and engagement that you see from the, um, the, the foundations, our, our donor community, um, uh, our, our city government. What are some of the big, big, big picture pieces that you feel like need to be on our radar um, and, and any sort of major upcoming kind of in pushes um, that, that we can um, engage in. And not everyone has to answer the question if you feel you know, compelled and go ahead and jump in. Maybe I'll start since I have a mic in my hands. Um, <laughs> That's always a good um, Big, big picture. I think um, one of the tremendous successes over the last few months that we've seen is that um, City Council has uh, committed in a big way towards uh, both public housing redevelopment and friendship courts redevelopment in terms of the, the fiscal, con fiscal contributions. And candidly, um, that, is, that is hugely impactful. And this is also just the first phase of both of these developments. Um, we, have, we have multiple phases to come, which will require a, uh, maybe not equal, but maybe equal sufficient uh, contributions from the city. So from a big picture, advocacy and support for that is, is really, really important. And we're talking about over the next you know, eight to 10 years as we go through redevelopment on both, uh, both realms. So, from that level, I think it's, it's a really key thing. Um, and what that does is it actually, uh, at least in terms of the work that we're doing specifically, we both utilize um, um, a program called Low Income Housing Tax Credits. And I'm not going to go into the details there, but it's a federal um, incentive program or, or the private, public private structure that allows for 
significant equity to come into affordable rental housing specifically it doesn't really touch the home ownership side but that when it's a competitive process and winning those tax credits at the state level requires local investment and so the 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 actually the benefit of the city's commitment is twofold on the one hand it the actual dollars make a tremendous difference but it actually means that knock on wood we are both both projects that we've submitted for low-income housing tax credits this last March we are both in a position by the end of May to win the tax credits honestly in large part because of the city's commitment so um, and that leverages the city's investment, uh, you know, four or five-fold relative to what how much they, money they put in. So it's a huge impact. Sunshine, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what the what does that advocacy look like in in, in layman's terms? Uh, <laughs> you know, in relationships you have, we have we have a um, um, an election coming up, and so you know we know the folks who are. Uh, not under, you know, are not moving on. They, they are in support of the work that we're doing. But as we look to uh, new elected city council members, um, having housing and a willingness to commit on the forefront in terms of how we advocate and vote, and then ideally how we uh, lobby them into the into the future, I think is is hugely important. And it could be, you know, this this year um, the city was able to do the work their work without increasing property taxes. They did increase. Um, some uh, the lodging tax and that sort of thing. And um, the levels of commitment that are necessary to redress the history that the city has in part created through the redevelopment of Friendship Court and public housing requires stretching ourselves. Um, and so a level of advocacy is, is supporting potential tax-related issues or tax-related increases if it's necessary as we move forward in future phases. So, so I'm glad that the focus is on neighborhood revitalization because I think the one thing that um, that I think that I really want to stress is it's not it's not as much what we do it's how we do it that matters and there have been a lot of housing interventions through the history of of uh, the U S and and I gotta be honest the majority of them haven't been sustainable they've been okay for a while but we've gone down and torn down the towers that we created. In, at, uh, in Chicago and Kansas City, et cetera. Um, and so we've taken neighborhoods, we've warehoused people, uh, they've, create, they've become communities, and then uh, we look at them from the outside that these have failed and we tear them down and start all over again and let people scatter to the wind. For me, we've spent a lot of time because we have almost by default gotten in, we got into neighborhood redevelopment and we wanted, our ethos was, was asset-based and appreciative community development is how can you build from within? How can you build on the strengths? What's already good about a neighborhood? And we thought we were doing it well, um, but in reality, every time we've done a new neighborhood, we realize the mistakes that we've made in the past and what we can do a little bit better. And so we're really at Southwood doubling and tripling down on, on asset-based community development. And so I was asked um, uh, even this morning what's taken so long at Southwood um, it's it's the, the the real building blocks of a community are, is not the brick and mortar, it's the work that you do working side by side with residents to help them uh, be able to articulate their dreams, to come together collectively so they can effectively take action, and then be the architects and engineer of their future. So, to boil that down, I would say when you're looking to make investments in in housing and neighborhood redevelopment, uh, do an audit of the organization that you're looking to support and make sure that they truly live and lean into that ethos of asset-based community development because that's the only way that the change is sustainable long term. We've spent a lot of time, a decade, looking at other redevelopment efforts across the country and seeing which ones have, have succeeded in the long term. And, and the common thread is that each one of them started with the first new question. What's good in your neighborhood? What would you like to amplify? Imagine 20 years from now, your neighborhood is cooking with gas. Uh, what has happened to 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 um, to help you realize that? And in every case, it's when you've when the residents themselves have been the ones who've been the agents of change, who have decided the future, determined the future, um, uh, and been the builders of that future that the neighborhoods uh, change sustainably. Part of, I think, how um, the community can help is uh, I think uh, Sunshine hit on it a little bit as we got new elected officials. Uh, coming on board, having conversations with them, if this is something that you believe in and that you 
feel like needs to be a uh, part of what they are talking about and what they're supporting, then I think we need to have those conversations. But I also think that we also need to look at things like um, when we look at uh, the planning of our community, um, how, how is that supportive? And how long is it taking for things to go through the process? Um, I think that's a, a, a part that really can um, deter folks from wanting to do good if, it's, if we make it so hard and so cumbersome for that good to take place. And I think that that's where um, your voices could also be lent to say, hey, I, I think this could be simplified. And I know the city has looked at ways to try and do that with bringing in Form based code institute, and that, that you know, for them to make recommendations, but all those recommendations haven't been fully adopted. So, how do we encourage the, con the continued uh, efficiencies that need to be in place so that we can get the work done um, uh, at a at a more expedited rate, so that the process is, isn't so hard um, that you don't deter someone from wanting to do the right thing. I think that that's how part of how we can help. Um, yeah, I, I echo that for sure. Um, having gone through our first site plan approval process, which actually was, was pretty quick, but I quickly learned all of the hurdles that there that exist through that process. Um, but I just wanted to echo something that Ebony brought up too, just about the importance of collaboration and I, I feel like the public housing project has been very resident driven and resident led, but we also have an all hands on deck model and we've got, the city has been cooperating great and putting up funding. We've had a great response from local philanthropists who are putting up funding and the private funding is also a critical um, element of unlocking the LIHTC funding that uh, Sunshine was referring to. So. It's all these meetings that we have in our conference room. We've got the you know heads of VHDA coming to the table, and they're like, "How did? How is this happening? That there's residents, there's private philanthropists, there's representatives of the, of the city, the housing authority, far. Um, like it seems like there's kind of this unprecedented level of collaboration happening in our community, and and also among all of these different projects where we're all trying to work together. And I think that's part of what's going to keep this thing going and going quickly. Ebony, can I say one more thing? Sure. Um, so over the next year or so, uh, the city is about to uh, embark on uh, developing a, a strategic housing plan. And the, the county is actually going to be doing the same thing in Albemarle County. Um, it's probably going to take a year or so to, un, to go through that process. A lot of that will be around community engagement, not only with the homeowners, but also with, uh, with a significant focus on communities that have historically been excluded from that process. Um, but I guarantee you that there are going to be some things that come out of that process which are going to be uh, confronting um, uh, for some of y'all and for the community as a whole around um, what the future of our city looks like. Uh, and in particular, the maps that Dan showed at the beginning, those that 70% that of our land mass being single family homes, um, that's gonna be a big question as we, as we go through the strategic housing plan and then as we move into um, the comp plan and, and, zo and zoning that has to, to, to take what we are, our ideal is, what our vision is out of the strategic housing plan and then actually how do we move into implementation and there are many, going to be many, many, many tools that we try to put on the table. One of those is going to be around zoning. Um, and there are going to be some, I guarantee there are going to be some hard conversations around that. So uh, at, you know, one of the things that you can do as we enter that process in a few months from now is to be open and um, communicate with your colleagues and friends around the need for uh, maybe stretching what your, your preconceptions are around what, what our city needs to look like in the future. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate the uh, responses and I just wanna um, reiterate some of the key things again. Um, one, a, a clear sort of um, uh, push for advocacy on multiple levels, but also a widening of our perspectives um, and curiosity around what some of these things mean and how they intersect um, uh, for our community. Um, the sort of uh, collaboration between um, different housing partners as well as our city government and with uh, philanthropists is really key 
um, in particular with regards to drawing, the, drawing down those low-income um, housing tax credits relies on both the, um, uh, the le leveraging resources from the city um, as well as our uh, philanthropic and private partners in that process. Um, and then finally, community engagement. And this is something that the foundation has really been espousing and um, especially through our grant making um, practices in that recognizing that most um, successful interventions and solutions to the problems that we face um, are really rooted um, in practices where the, the people who are most impacted by them are the co-creators of both the intervention and participating in the implementation of those strategies. And so I really want to echo what Dan was saying with regards to vetting organizations who start with that premise in the way that they're operating. Um, and so, you know, those are the sort of larger scale pictures of how we might uh, engage. But we recognize that there are things that are happening right here um, and right now in our communities. And so how might we best leverage our resources to look at some of the near term uh, stabilizing uh, needs that are um, that are present for us? So I think that, um, well, obviously we are a new organization. We're a new community development corporation. So for us, um, you know, we're still in our uh, very much a, our startup phase of growing and, and building our internal capacity. And, um, you know, we are um, very fortunate. We have a partnership with the Social Entrepreneurship Center at the university that helps support us, but we do need to continue to grow and expand. And so for, uh, for our organization, it's about building that capacity, be, being able to um, be sustainable long term. Uh, but also, as we continue to build down and as we go through the small area plan process with the Star Hill uh, area, and as that uh, comes to a conclusion and that plan goes before um, the city council and, and the community, um, that there is um, advocacy for how do we utilize opportunities that exist uh, within that small area, things like city yard or you know other areas uh, that may be uh, of interest in that particular area, and then being able to get support to be able to to go after that, uh, to those opportunities. Um, so I think that for us, our needs may be a little bit differently because we are new, and versus. Uh, some of the other organizations that are represented here that are in a more a mature um, uh, you know time of, of their their existence um, their mean their needs may be a little bit differently so. Yolanda yeah. you and I have talked before about this and uh, moving outside of the uh, small area plan I, I do understand that um, there are current development mm -hmm. um, redevelopment and uh, pr practices and neighborhoods and business uh, growth that is happening in the community. Can you just share a little bit about how you guys view um, a, a just sort of wider scope of um, development and participation for this sort of rising black middle class in those things as well? Absolutely. And, and uh, so for us, we're not just one place. It's not just our focus. Star Hill is where we're starting. Um, but New Hill is looking at the entire map of the area of the broader community of Charlottesville, and what are the opportunities that are coming online uh, that are that could be leveraged uh, to help incubate new businesses or to um, create more job opportunity? Um, you have things that you know whether you like them or don't like them, like the Dairy Central pro uh, project that's going on. Uh, that's going to have retail space in it. So, are African American businesses being prepared to be able to go into that space? Um, and I think that that's something that is very critical. Uh, so we do uh, collaborate with uh, the CIC, the Community Investment Collaborative, uh, with their, uh, their entrepreneurship program. And what does that look like um, for pre pre preparing individuals to be able to go into spaces like that or to other opportunities that may be built with Friendship Court or with uh, Southwood if they have retail spaces and they're open to you know, others uh, coming into those spaces. What does that look like? We want to make sure that we're not just uh, reacting, but if we see and we know that development is coming and what may happen with that development, um, then are we preparing individuals to be able to take advantage of that? And I think that you know part of our strategic alliances with organizations like 
CIC where we're partnering with them to take a look, to work with them on the financial piece, uh, working with individuals to do uh, financial planning so that they are prepared. Where are they currently with their current credit scores and their current capital? And are they in a position to be able to get their, their dream, their vision capitalized once they go through that program or if they're in a place right now where they're looking to expand, are they in a financial position for that to happen? So we, we, we say that yes, we want to see more black businesses, but what are some of the challenges? A large challenge is capital and their the ability to access it. And a large part of what that is you know, based on is their personal uh, financial history. And so if that um, has some challenges to it, then that becomes a reason to say no. And so we wanna be able to remove that as a barrier for individuals and so, so that they can get to a yes, but then not only a yes because their personal finances are in place, but also that their, their understanding of the, the financial needs of their business has been heightened as well so that they can uh, go in and have that conversation with a, an investor or a, um, or a banker uh, regarding what their business looks like and what the future of their business looks like, and they can talk with confidence uh, about that. But for us, it's about looking at the broader scope of what's happening in our community and saying, there's an opportunity over there. Let's make sure that we are uh, helping to engage individuals that want to take that next step, that they that they may not be aware of that opportunity that's coming, but then we can build those relationships to make sure that that possibility exists and we can help get folks into a uh, position to take advantage. All right, thanks. Um, Sunshine, I'm getting calls for time and we wanna make sure that everyone has an opportunity to, uh, uh, from the audience to ask questions. Um, this is an ambitious um, program, obviously, and certainly just the tip of the iceberg, um, but I hope that what we've uh, presented thus far has been helpful, um, knowing that this is an ongoing conversation and recognizing that there are many intersections with this with regards to economic mobility, business creation, um, child care, um, et cetera. So just to give everyone an opportunity um, to speak in closing, um, we recognize that this issue can seem very overwhelming right, um, and quite daunting to fix. And so I do want to um, give the panelists an opportunity to think through what is it that you would like people to walk away from this conversation with? What is one call to action that you would like to um, um, offer? Or, um, or, or a sense of, um, of what you've seen that's working um, in the community. So feel free to answer one of those. <laughs> um, boil that down. Um, so I'm going to start to answer that question by throwing out two very scary numbers that have a lot of people in this town kind of um, freaked out. One is 12,000 and the other is 4,000. Uh, so the city and the regional housing partnership each conducted a needs assessment in the, in the, in the city and then in the region and found that, that by 2040 there's a need for 4,000 and what this what the study said was units in the city of Charlottesville and 12,000 in the region. I want to recast that a little bit and that um, we're not going to build 4,000 units in the city. To do so, we'd have to build a city a quarter the size of Charlottesville just to create enough affordable housing. And so I would really like to get people to leave today thinking about interventions rather than units. Now we need a lot of units. The majority of those 12,000 interventions need to be unit based because we have a severe, severe supply constraint. But uh, there are other things. For example, uh, Sunshine and I are part of a collaboration that's trying to put together a housing hub. So one of the things that we heard when, when we talked with folks in the community who have come to us looking for housing is they just don't even know where to start. In fact, we even heard from one woman who went through the whole Habitat program for three years, bought a house, and said, I wasn't really looking for home ownership. I just needed a place to live. And so what we, one of the things we have to do, first of all, is take the inventory that exists now and make more of it accessible for, and affordable. Other interventions as well, you need to look at the, um, um, uh, basically the value chain. So the kind of work that Yolanda is doing, helping to provide capital for folks so that they can afford housing, that's <coughs> critical. Uh, we need funding, for example, we have a full-time business incubation specialist at Southwood. We have 90 businesses at Southwood that are 
legal but unconforming. They're operated out of the trailers. We have an incredibly, incredibly entrepreneurial community. And what we're trying to do is work one-on-one -on -one with each one of those folks to dream about what they would like in the future and to remove some of the barriers that, 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 it, that it takes to, um, to get there. That takes money and it's hard to find that kind of funding to, to fund somebody who's standing side by side with that person. So, so all of us, Sunshine has a, um, uh, uh, he's working on an early childhood uh, uh, center, which again is harder money to find than housing money but that's the kind of thing that builds, these are the foundational building blocks that ultimately end up creating a value chain that allows people to get into housing. Yeah, I think, um, Dan, with the 4,000 and the 12,000, those are very daunting numbers. And I think a lot of you all have heard the, uh, Ridge Schuyler's Orange Dot presentation maybe a couple times. And um, part of the problem is with the rising rents, people aren't making enough money because they aren't trained and uh, I don't have certain skills to be able to get the jobs that might actually exist here, that they just, they aren't connecting the dots to get to those jobs. So one of the things that we're really excited on the public housing uh, redevelopment, which I think will um, connect with all of these projects, is how do we train residents in some of these skills as part of the construction, or if we're installing solar panels on the buildings, which we plan to do, how do we train residents in, in solar, which will hopefully be a booming business as, as we continue to move towards renewable energy. So I think not only are we providing housing, but we're hopefully creating opportunities for people to you know, move up this ladder in general through creating jobs. And um, especially if we're all building housing, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, I think, for people to learn new skills. I thought in for just a second because yeah. I want to praise Anne for a second. <laughs> so one, one of the things, talking about partnerships around business incubation, one of the things that, that Red Light has offered is to build a, a mixed-use a mixed uh, mixed use building at Southwood is one of the first buildings. And they're looking to donate the commercial space for the first five years for Southwood business incubation so that the core downtown neighborhood in Southwood is not Qdoba or McDonald's, but it's... Jose's Taqueria and Jeanette's Barbershop. And so I wanted to thank Anne and Corin and Red Light for that. I think you, you can more thank Corin, but yeah. <laughs> um, to, to be very quick, um, the, 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 I mean, the key, uh, sorry, I don't know a lot of things I could say here, but the, um, the key focus for us, is we think we largely have the housing, at least in phase one, the, the, at Friendship Court, the, the housing costs covered, largely speaking. It's what I was referring to before around those other support systems, and the, some of which are commercial opportunities, and one of which in particular is this early childhood center in phase one. That is the key ingredient. E each phase sort of has its own uh, opportunity for um, building more than just housing. And in phase one, that primary is the early childhood center and the, and the impact that that's going to have a high quality early childhood center, an impact that's gonna have on generations to come. Um, and so that's where the, the primary focus of our fundraising is at the moment, is in that, that key component. And then the last comment I'll make, and just stepping back for a second, is that yes, the numbers 4,000 and 12,000 are, are daunting, um, but if you consider Southwood, Public Housing, and Friendship Court, and potentially New Hill and what comes up there, those, th this work right here actually is probably more than half the solution, literally, in terms of the number of units and interventions that we're talking about when you aggregate it all together through the multiple phases. Um, so this is, this is actually where a significant amount of that, that work and energy is happening right now. So it is achievable. So in uh, one of our focus groups this week, and one of the senior members of our community. Um, he lives over in the 10th Page community, and when, uh, when the subject of affordable um, housing came up, he said, affordable for whom, was his, uh, his question. And, um, and so when we talk about interventions um, and talk about the housing need, um, part of what has to happen is that there has to be a rise in the amount of money that people have access to. Um, because affordability for, you know, affordability is relative, right? You know, what's affordable for some is not affordable for others. And it's all based on your access to resources and how much resources you have at your disposal. So if we can uh, change, help to move the needle on 
what people have access to, how many um, new jobs, you know, we know that the, you know, the hospital is expanding and there's probably a thousand new jobs that are coming along with that. How many from this community will be able to have access to that? And those jobs are, you know, access to the jobs that are paying at a higher rate of pay because then that helps with the housing crisis that we have as individuals are able to earn more then the, their, their need uh, affordability becomes a little bit different. And so obviously, you know, we know that the, that the price of housing here is pretty high, um, but at the end of the day, we've got to also work the angle of, we've got to make sure that there is more wealth, that there is more of uh, buying power and, and more income and more disposable income so that individuals can really take advantage of um, what is here and what is to come um, and that they can do it in a more um, in a more comfortable way, in, in, a, in a way that they really want to participate in. So I think that that's a, a large part of what we have to also focus on as well. Great, thank you all. I really uh, appreciate your time. Uh, where are we, Katie? Yeah. Um, we have about five minutes left. Oh goodness! <laughs> um, so who has that magic question? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Do any of you all have any ideas or suggestions or how we can improve that opportunity? Thank you so much for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. Transportation is something that is uh, very um, uh, present on the minds uh, um, of the folks at the foundation. Um, and we're hoping to gather um, a roundtable, um, a, a convening related to transportation later um, in the fall. And so does anyone have any specific um, thoughts or ideas around that? I'll just say very quickly that um, when you think about housing affordability, you actually have to think about it primarily from three different perspectives. One, of course, is the cost of the home itself. Second is how your transportation from that home to your place of business, to school, um, and then the third is actually the cost of utilities, um, which is oftentimes the most volatile of those numbers um, because you know, the seasonal the change over time. Um, speaking about Friendship Corps, actually most of our projects here, uh, Friendship Corps in particular, we are ideally situated in the heart of Charlottesville, two blocks from the, the bus mall to be actually, and, and part of the reason that we want to not only redevelop the housing that's on their on the site on, on right now, but also increase the amount of affordable hills, housing on site is because of its location and its opportunity for ease of transportation to good schools, to jobs, to, econo uh, to educational opportunities, et cetera. But we have to be thinking about transportation as well. And it sounds like that's a future conversation. Definitely, yes. on that I think is critical is the ability to get some um, education and financial acumen into the minority community so that they know how to deal with banks and they know how to plan for their own futures and can grow from um, subsidized housing to affordable housing to something better because all of that takes some financial planning. That's one comment. The other uh, thing that you all didn't touch on maybe a little out of your purview, is for gainful employment in this community, not only for the minority community, but for a lot of the poor community, is access to affordable childcare. And uh, it, it, because they're too, too, you know, mom and dad both working, um, and I think that's a, a big issue that fits into this that isn't really being addressed very well by city council. Thank you. Um, um, I uh, just wanted to uh, have the privilege of knowing uh, the folks on this panel and the work that they're doing, and it certainly is um, a critical component. And I think one of the um, takeaways from today is that while we're sort of um, really um, 
highlighting and elevating the issue with regards to affordable housing, that there are other components to that um, affordability that are really critical and other key components that make that um, important. And so um, as we're looking at evaluating things through our grant-making practices, our uh, philanthropic giving, to recognizing that um, it's simply not just about the buildings. Um, and then there's one thing that I want to um, just share also um, from our perspective is just that I don't want us to um, you know, forget about the other cultural components of this and that we can build lots of buildings and we can get folks lots of jobs, but welcoming is a very um, different scenario. And I think Sunshine brought this up when we're talking about, when we think about the zoning conversations that are going to be coming up, is really thinking about the, the, mech, the, the reasons behind we feel like our communities should look a particular way and what traditions that we're holding on to and what is the, where is the spaciousness um, to invite alternatives to how it is that we're living today. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in addition to the, our giving and our strategies with regards to grant making, I think it's equally critical for us to think about our attitudes and beliefs regarding um, welcoming, with, with regarding density, with regards to um, you know even our architecture, which we you know really spent, <laughs> spent a great time preserving a particular aesthetic um, in our communities. And so, what does it look like to stretch ourselves in multiple um, directions as we consider some of these pieces? All right. Any final questions? All right. Well, thank you all for uh, being here today. I really appreciate your time and energy. Um, please um, take a moment if you, um, if you need to um, talk to one of our panelists or staff members as you're heading out. Are there places for people to write um, any information? Okay, there are um, pads and um, uh, papers on your sheet, so leave us a note, take notes with you. Um, but thank you again for being here. And a, a round of applause for our panelists. Please.